Perfect. OK, so thank you so much, everybody, for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here today. I'm excited to have this opportunity to uh, share some of my research background and my future research ideas with you, members of Ingenuity Labs, in a presentation that I've entitled Multi-Hazard Protection and Post-Disaster Assessment of Built Infrastructure Using Hybrid Simulation and Advanced Sensors. So this is probably going to be a little bit out of your comfort zone. We're going to go a little heavy on the civil engineering side of things, but I hope that it will still be very interesting for you. Just to tell you a little bit more about my background, so I'm formally trained as a civil engineer and I recently completed my PhD at Carleton University in 2018. My PhD focused on the seismic retrofit and rehabilitation of reinforced concrete buildings and uh, the development and application of this test method that we call hybrid simulation that you're going to learn a lot about today. Um, as part of that research, uh, we established a multi-million dollar CFI funded multi-hazard research test facility at Carleton University. And uh, as part of my PhD program, I took, my, took part in a two-month research exchange at the National Center for Research on Earthquake Engineering in Taiwan. And for this past year, as Josh mentioned, I was a postdoctoral fellow at Ecole Polytechnique Montreal, working on advanced applications of hybrid simulation in earthquake engineering. So the overall goal of my research is to ensure that we have safe, resilient, and smart infrastructure. And when we look at the sort of core ideas or core themes of Ingenuity Labs, I think there's a lot of common ground there and opportunities for collaboration, specifically related to creating intelligent systems and infrastructure um, that enhance human safety and productivity, as well as studying the complex interactions that exist between humans and our infrastructure. And I think you'll see throughout my presentation today that collaboration has been a strong part of my, my background, my research background. And I truly believe that through multidisciplinary collaboration, we're able to solve some of the most complex and challenging problems, not only in civil engineering, but in all of engineering. And I think that uh, Ingenuity Labs can be a great engine in the driver of those solutions. So I'm excited about potential opportunities for collaboration. So my presentation today is about multi-hazard protection of built infrastructure. And when I talk about hazards or extreme events, I'm talking about either natural or man-made extreme events that can affect or influence the performance of our infrastructure. So that could be an earthquake, fire, wind, blast, a tsunami, extreme cold temperatures here in Canada, or of course climate change. So when we talk about multi-hazard, where this idea came from is that traditionally in civil engineering, we've used what we refer to as, or what I'll refer to as, a silo-based approach to designing our infrastructure. That means we consider each hazard individually in the design of these structures. More recently, there's been this shift towards what we call a multi-hazard performance-based design approach. That means that we should be able to consider multiple hazard or multi-hazard design scenarios when we are designing our infrastructure. And that presents sort of a unique challenge for us as civil engineers because we need advanced test methods so that we can study how infrastructure behaves during these multi-hazard scenarios. And we need advanced sensors that we can use to monitor how our structure is behaving. Uh, either during an extreme event or perform sort of a structural condition assessment after an extreme event. So that's where my research really comes in. So today I'm going to talk about this idea of hybrid simulation and complex actuation and, and touch on a couple of advanced sensors that we can use for structural condition monitoring or assessment. And then finally I'll wrap things up uh, with some collaborative research themes that I think will be really interesting as future uh, sort of projects here in Ingenuity Labs. So we'll start off with complex actuation and hybrid simulation. Now, I just want you to keep in mind, uh, most of my research background has been in the area of earthquake engineering. So a lot of the research examples that I'll provide today are in earthquake engineering, but our goal moving forward is to apply these same concepts to sort of this idea of multi-hazard design. So in order to understand where hybrid simulation came from, I need to tell you a little bit of a story uh, and I'll use my research background to sort of lay out how we came to this idea of hybrid simulation and how this test method was developed. So if we start off with this project that I was involved in a little over 10 years ago, which focused on the seismic retrofit of deficient reinforced concrete walls using externally bonded carbon fiber reinforced polymer sheets. So you probably, you've probably heard of carbon fiber. Uh, we use it to build expensive things like airplanes and sports cars. And this project was focused on using carbon fiber as a structural material to retrofit existing deficient structures. Specifically, concrete walls that past earthquake experience had shown us can suffer sudden and brittle failure during moderate to large ground shaking. 
So the retrofitting, the retrofitting strategy that we studied was this use of CFRP sheets. The benefits of CFRP as a retrofitting strategy include the fact that it can be applied in a timely manner. It's lightweight and high strength and resistant to environmental degradation. So there's many benefits for us uh, when we look at CFRP as a retrofitting strategy. To understand how this retrofitting strategy worked, we tested 13 concrete walls in our lab at Carleton University. The walls had different dimensions, different geometry, different reinforcement ratios so that we can understand how it behaves in these different configurations. And we tested the walls in the lab using the traditional test method that we've used for the past, let's say, 40 or 50 years in earthquake engineering. And this test method involves the application of this sort of assumed reverse cyclic lateral load sequence that we feel is representative of the demand on a structural element during an earthquake. So how it works is essentially we have a concrete wall. It gets fi it's fixed at its base to the strong floor in our lab. And we use a hydraulic actuator to apply this in-plane displacement history to the top of the wall. And we feel that this is sort of representative of an earthquake. The wall is moving back and forth. We're, get we're determining its strength, its ductility, how far we can push it, and all of these other parameters. So to give you some sense of the results, we tested walls without carbon fiber sheets. As expected, they failed in sort of a brittle, very sudden and brittle manner and demonstrated to us that yes, okay, we need to come up with an effective retrofitting strategy to improve their seismic performance. So we installed the CFRP sheets in many of the walls. Uh, the installation is, is not actually all that complicated. That's one of the benefits of using this retrofitting strategy. It's a lot like putting up wallpaper, if anyone still puts up wallpaper, but it's very similar. You use epoxy in what is called a wet layup process. We basically adhere the sheets to the wall. And then we tested them again. So you can see here, um, basically the red line is the original wall and the black is the retrofitted wall. So you can see significant increase in strength, but more importantly for earthquake engineering in ductility. That's essentially how much can we deform the wall before it fails, before the load, its load carrying capacity drops. And failure in these types of systems occurs uh, as a result of a phenomenon called debonding. That's when the CFRP sheet essentially delaminates from the concrete. And as the wall cycles back and forth, that delamination sort of spreads. You can see the spreading happening here until ultimately the CFRP is no longer contributing to the strength of the wall and it fails. So that's sort of a process that we call debonding. So ultimately in this project, we found that yes, CFRP can be an effective retrofitting strategy to improve the performance of these deficient walls specifically enhancing their strength and ductility. But once the project was over, I was left with a lot of questions about how realistic is this applied load sequence of an actual earthquake? Doesn't seem so realistic in your mind when you think about ground shaking. What earthquake magnitude or hazard level does this load sequence represent? And what about the system level response or global response of the rest of the structure? We're not capturing any of that here. We're studying the response of one element from our structure. What about the rest of the structure? So these are some questions that we had sort of following this uh, experimental program. And these are common questions that we've had in earthquake engineering when we use this sort of what we call component level structural testing method. We've used this method for many, many years, whether it be a column, a wall, a beam, a beam column joint, and we test them under these simple in-plane reverse cyclic load sequences to determine their strength, ductility, and some of these characteristics about them. But we're always left with these same questions. So what other alternative test methods do we have? Well, one test method is uh, what's called a shaking table test, which is basically exactly how it sounds. These are enormous tables uh, connected to hydraulic actuators, and we essentially shake the tables back and forth. So these are two notable examples of shake tables in the world. This one is in Japan. It's called E-Defense. That's a full-scale concrete building. This one's at UC San Diego. It's, I think the, it has the highest payload. I think the payload of this shake table is 100,000 tons. So we can build a full-scale structure on the table and shake it back and forth. And uh, in this approach, sorry, I'll just go back. In this approach, of course, if we do these types of tests, we're able to subject our structure to a real ground motion of known magnitude and obtain system level response. So it's perfect. I got all of the things that I didn't know about before. So this is a project. Here's another example. This is a project that I collaborated on while I was at the National Center for Research on Earthquake Engineering in Taiwan. So this is a roughly 15 meter tall building. Um, and we subjected it to a number of uh, near fault earthquake events. So I'll just give you sort of an idea of what that looks like. So this particular earthquake that this building is about to be subjected to is from the 1999 Chi Chi earthquake, which is a very large earthquake uh, in Taiwan, caused a lot of damage. 
So you can see the building starting to move back and forth, and then we have sort of this huge pulse, and we have a lot of damage happening, spalling, cracking, crushing. And of course, we're obtaining information about the system level response of the entire structure. So after the test is over, we're able to do all sorts of cool things, understand how all of these structural elements behave. And uh, it's a really interesting process. But there are some drawbacks of this approach, obviously, in that the test facility, the, the money required not only for the test facility, but also for the specimens. Right? You can imagine the tremendous sum of money that it would cost to build essentially a full scale structure on one of these shake tables. And as a result, we're also limited in the number of tests that we can conduct. We just simply can't test you know, 20 or 30 of these buildings. And these are not, this particular test method is not necessarily applicable to other hazards. It works really well in earthquake engineering, but what about a tsunami or a significant wind event? So this leads us to this concept of hybrid simulation. This is where sort of hybrid simulation came from, how it evolved. And hybrid simulation works by combining what we call an analytical substructure. This is essentially a finite element model of a civil engineering structure and a physical substructure, which is an experimental test in the lab. And the two are combined together using something called a middleware. So this is the concept. And I'll give you an example of how it works. So let's say, for instance, we have this two-story concrete frame. And we're really interested in civil engineers in understanding how one of these first-story columns behaves. So we take that column out of the building and we'll test it in our lab. We have the rest of the structure in the finite element model, including all of the mass and the damping, all of the dynamic effects. It's all captured in the model. And we test our column in the lab under the, degrees, the appropriate degrees of freedom to maintain compatibility with our finite element model. So in this case, we're using a complex sort of actuation, multiple hydraulic actuators, in order to control these degrees of freedom at the top of the column. And then how it works is that we subject our model to an earthquake. And we solve for the response of the structure just like we would in a normal nonlinear analysis in that we march in time using numerical integration to solve for the response of the system during each time step until we've completed the entire earthquake record. So how it works is that we solve the equations of motion. We need to provide the initial stiffness matrix so that we can get the displacement response of the structure during the very first time step. These time steps are very, very small. We then apply those displacements in the lab to our physical specimen. We'll measure the forces from our actuators using load cells. And we'll feed those forces back into the finite element model so that our finite element model is sort of taking into account the true nonlinear behavior of this structural element. And then we'll continue this process, solving for the displacement response during the next time step, applying those displacements in the lab, measuring forces, feeding them back, and we'll keep on doing this until the entire earthquake is over so that we have the complete displacement response, the complete force response. And in this approach, we've been able to study how our physical specimen in the lab behaves under a realistic ground motion record of known magnitude. At the end of the test, not only do we have the response of our physical specimen in the lab, but we also have the complete response of our finite element model. So, we have a real, so then we, now we have some idea about the system level response of the rest of the structure. It uses readily available equipment. So we don't, this equipment that we're using to run a hybrid test is available in most civil engineering labs. So that takes care of the sort of unique facility aspect. We can test different structural configurations by changing the model and having multiple specimens. So we can do multiple tests. And it's applicable to other hazards because we can subject our finite element model to all sorts of different whether it be a wind event or a fire event. So there's a lot of potential here to apply this concept, although it was developed in earthquake engineering, to other types of hazards. So that's how it works in theory. In practice, during this second half of my PhD, we decided to see if it would work, particularly with respect to studying the seismic response of a three-story reinforced concrete building. Yeah? Just to clarify. Yeah. That so uh, in, if it's a real-time hybrid test, then all of that happens in real time. Exactly. So we do conduct a lot of times what we call a pseudo-dynamic hybrid test, which is at an extended rate. So because all of the mass is in the model, the finite element model, uh, we can still conserve all of the dynamic properties in the model, and we're just testing our physical specimen. It all just happens slower than in reality. We only do that if our specimen that we're testing in the lab isn't rate dependent. So if the, you know, it, it, there's no difference between doing a test slowly or rapidly. Exactly. So we do have to make some compromises. The goal, ultimately, in many, many 
sort of years is to be able to do real-time hybrid tests. But right now, we're just, uh, we're just not at that point right now. Yeah, the goal is to get there, though. We have some problems with hydraulic control, with delay, with the size of our finite element models. We have all of these challenges. Yeah, did you have another? Yeah, let me ask you a really yeah. sure. Yeah, you could do that, but there are a lot of problems with scaling in terms of like uh, availability of materials. Like for example, in concrete, um, the size of the aggregates in the concrete that will affect how the system behaves. So we have a lot of scaling effects. So basically, what that means is that if we were to test a really small building on a shake table, a model building, that's not going to behave the same as the full scale structure. Has some differences there. Um, so this project. Uh, we wanted to apply this hybrid concept to a three-story shear wall building. So we need to design sort of a prototype building that we can base our tests off of. So we, we designed the complete structure just like we normally would if we were civil engineers so that we can come up with this sort of typical shear wall design. This will be the subject of our hybrid simulation. So how it works is that we have our analytical substructure, which is in a finite element software. Now, because of the challenges that we have in terms of computational availability, we had to sort of shrink our model size. So we only actually studied one of the shear walls in the building. This was one of the limitations of this particular study. So we focused on one of the shear walls. We wanted to test the first story shear wall in the lab because during an earthquake, that first story shear wall will, will have the most damage. It will behave uh, in, the non very, very, in a very, very nonlinear manner, which is difficult to model. So we'll test it in the lab. And we'll connect the two together using a middleware, which in this case is called OpenFresco. So we have our finite element model of the second and the third stories of the shear wall. And of course, we have our experimental specimen here. To model the concrete in the upper levels, we use this sort of multi-layered shell element modeling approach. Basically, we convert this normal looking shear wall with all of the steel reinforcement into many, many layers in the shell element. So the shell element has layers of steel. And then we're able to sort of predict what the nonlinear response of the concrete wall might be. This is our experimental test setup in the lab. So we have our, this is the concrete wall, which represents sort of the first story of the three story wall. And we're using our three actuators to control our vertical displacement, lateral displacement, and rotation at the top of the shear wall. And we're using this sort of steel loading beam to apply those forces or displacements. So here you can see how the hydraulic control works. So we're using sort of a special hydraulic control scheme so that based on the position of this control point, we're able to move our actuators to get the exact X displacement, Y displacement, and rotation that we need. So some software is performing that transformation for us so that our actuators know exactly how much to move to get the appropriate displacement. In terms of other instrumentation, we have our sort of conventional displacement transducers, strain gauges, and digital image correlation. I'm going to talk a little bit about digital image correlation a bit later on in my presentation. So we subject the structure to uh, multiple earthquakes in this case at increasing intensity. So we do that to try and get an understanding about how will the building behave at different hazard levels. So if the earthquake gets bigger, how does the behavior change? And we're subjecting, uh, we're subjecting the, the, the wall to an earthquake only in one direction in this particular case. So here, you can, this just gives you a sense of how the system behaves. Here you can see the acceleration time record. So at each step during this ground motion, the hydraulic control, the, lab, the equipment in our lab is communicating with the finite element model and they're communicating back and forth, sending displacements, feeding back forces. Now, although this looks like it's happening very quickly, it's been sped up. Each of these tests took roughly seven-ish hours. So it's happening very slowly because our finite element model takes a long time to converge with our sort of simple computer that we're using. That's non-real-time, non exactly. The goal is to do real-time hybrid testing. That's in the direction that we're going in. Uh, of course, because uh, we also, not only do we have our experimental specimen in the lab, we also have our finite element model. So we're also capturing the system level response of the complete structure. So we're getting a lot of information here about what the accelerations are, what the displacements are for the full scale wall. So this study was 
um, a lot of this study was focused on like the feasibility of doing one of these hybrid tests. Like, is it actually possible to use hybrid simulation to study the response of a concrete shear wall building? And after it was over, we were pretty pleasantly surprised in that, yes, sure, it's okay, it's possible. So then the next step was to say, okay, let's do what we did before. Let's repair the walls that we had tested with carbon fiber reinforced polymer sheets. So we took the wall, we repaired some of the cracks, we put the carbon fiber on there. In this particular case, we only put it on one side. The idea was to try to improve um, sort of the efficiency of the retrofitting process so that we only needed to access one side. And then we did the hybrid simulations again. So in this case, now we're testing the response of the system under realistic ground motion. So the red was the original wall without any carbon fiber. And the blue is after being repaired. And you can see that after sort of fixing up the cracks and putting on the carbon fiber sheets, the response of the wall is almost identical. So we've basically re restored a lot of the stiffness and the strength of the original wall. So the stiffness, the strength is almost completely restored and you can see that the displacement response is very, very comparable. The only difference is that we see slightly larger displacements at the end of the test. That's because it's easier to reopen the existing cracks than it was to form them in the original test. So we see slightly higher residual displacements. Okay, so that study finished, and we were like, okay, well, that worked well. Hybrid simulation, maybe we can use this as a tool. So we said, okay, it's feasible to use hybrid simulation to sort of study the seismic response of civil structures, and our CFRP retrofit works well. But then we started to think about, okay, how can we improve how realistic it is? So how realistic was our earthquake load? So during the test, we only applied the earthquake load in one direction, right? Which isn't very realistic. We don't know what direction earthquake is going to come from. So normally we'll have bi-directional ground motion records. And the system level structural response was a bit simplified because we had a very simple finite element model. So can we make that model more complex? These are some questions um, that we asked after that study. So during my postdoctoral work this year, we said, okay, can we use hybrid simulation to study the 3D seismic response of a concrete building? So what we did, we designed another building that would be the subject for the different hybrid simulation. It's a five-story building in Montreal. And we said, okay, uh, let's take one of the first-story C-shaped walls and subject it to bidirectional earthquake ground motion. If we do that, that means we need to control all six degrees of freedom instead of just three during, my last test, during our previous tests. So during the previous tests, we had our X displacement, Y displacement, and rotation. Now we have all six. Can we model the full structure and test one of the first story walls in the lab? So this is one of the first story walls. This is roughly four meters or so. So this thing is pretty enormous. This is the uh, multi-axial sub-assemblage sub testing system at Ecole Polytechnique. So there's eight actuators. We use the eight actuators to control six degrees of freedom in this case. So this thing's essentially like a giant robot that we use to do civil structural testing. And you can see all six degrees of freedom here all eight actuators moving together in unison to essentially produce the correct displacements at our control point, which is at the top of the wall in this particular case. We modeled, this time we modeled the complete structure. So although this is a simplified sort of drawing, in our finite element model, we had the whole building, all the beams, all the columns, all the walls, everything. We had to use sort of a simplified, uh, what they call macro model for the shear wall. So we weren't using shell elements like we did during the past test. Again, because of the computational efficiency, just trying to make the model run a little bit faster so these tests wouldn't take so long. We subjected the building, this time, bidirectional earthquakes, again, at increasing intensity, so trying to get a sense of how the structure will behave at different hazard levels. And here, this is one of the tests. So you can see the wall moving around. The displacements are small because the building is very stiff, but it doesn't take much to crack and crush. Like after this test is over, it's completely cracked. All of the steel inside has yielded, been stretched. So, um, and some pretty significant displacements, like almost 20 millimeters of displacement, which is a lot in civil engineering. So we were pretty happy with that test. Of course, because this is a hybrid simulation, we're also getting the system level response of the rest of the structure. So the only shortcoming of this particular test is that these tests took 90 hours each, which is a very, very long time. 
uh, for a number of reasons. Some challenges with hydraulic control because we have eight actuators uh, controlling six degrees of freedom. They don't like it when you go too fast. We sort of lose, we would lose control sometimes. Um, the other challenge obviously is with the model solving in real, like as fast as po we could possibly make it solve in this particular case. That's hybrid simulation. So now you know sort of what this idea of hybrid simulation is, how it works. Our goal moving forward is to extend this concept of hybrid simulation to other types of hazards. That's the, one of the other directions that we're going. So we want to ha try to have it happen in real time, and we want to extend this concept to other hazards so that we can ultimately uh, study multi-hazard scenarios on our built infrastructure. So the second topic that I'm going to talk about is related to advanced sensors for structural condition assessment and monitoring. So the first project that I'll talk about is something you may be very familiar with. It's related to the use of distributed fiber optic sensors, which uh, you're probably familiar with because of the work of Dr. Holt. So this was a multidisciplinary research collaboration with Dr. Bao at the University of Ottawa. And we wanted to test this new type of fiber optic sensor in our lab at Carleton. Traditionally, in these types of applications, we would use strain gauges to monitor strain. The problem with strain gauges when you have a very large surface is that it's going to take not only a lot of time to install all of the strain gauges, but also you need a lot of data acquisition channels to monitor all those strain gauges, and you need money to buy all the strain gauges. So this is a sort of very uh, economical and interesting alternative. So we applied the fiber optic sensor here. You can see it in the horizontal direction. Here it's in the vertical direction. And our idea, our idea was to try to uh, sort of study, we, see if we could integrate the sensor into the material to create a sort of smart material so that in the future, we could maybe embed a fiber optic sensor in the carbon fiber sheets during installation. Then over the service life of the structure, we could use it to monitor what is the strain. So we can sort of monitor the performance of our infrastructure over time. So we, we use the distributed fiber optic sensor in this controlled environment. This is typical output that we get from it. So we had almost 50 meters of fiber in total. We have a strain gauge every sort of one centimeter or so, and we're able to uh, collect a lot of data. The problem is, is that we get thousands and thousands of data points, uh, which isn't very useful to us when it's in a graph like this. So it requires extensive and time consuming post-processing for us to be able to visualize the results. But ultimately, we can get to something that looks something like this, where we're able to see how the distribution of strain varies in the wall as we load it back and forth. So essentially, this is the vertical strain. And if you remember, we're cycling the wall back and forth like that. So you can see sort of the vertical strain flipping back and forth. It becomes tensile strain on one side, compressive strain on the other, then it will flip direction during the opposite load cycle. So we ultimately found that this was a pretty useful tool to sort of monitor strain fields in our sheet, because before that, we really had no idea. We would have strain gauge readings from a couple of points, but we really had no idea what was the true distribution of strain. So this was sort of an interesting project to work on. The second project there, the second sensor that I'll talk about is called digital image correlation. Has anyone actually, has anyone here heard of digital image correlation before? Okay, a few people, which is good. So this is something that I had a chance to work on while I was in Taiwan. Essentially, I wanted to study the application of digital image correlation in civil engineering, but particularly in reinforced concrete structures, to mark uh, cracks. So usually what we would do during an experiment, which I did during my master's work, was manually mark cracks, which you can see, given the number of cracks in this particular concrete wall, takes a very, very long time. Sometimes we also have to measure how wide they are. So the idea was, can we use digital image correlation to not only capture crack distributions, but also know how wide all the cracks are? It would save us a lot of time in the lab, but we could also use it in real world applications, again, to monitor how our infrastructure is behaving over time. So uh, if you're not familiar with digital image correlation, essentially what it does is we use two fixed cameras, it can be two or more cameras actually, and we, we mark the surface of our specimen, whatever we want to monitor with this speckly pattern. And we have to do some calibration in order to figure out what, where, our position, where our cameras are located in three-dimensional space. But then essentially what we do is we take photos of our specimen as we load it, as it deforms. And using the digital image correlation software, we're able to track how the points move in space. And by tracking how the speckle pattern moves, we're able to get the displacement. And from the displacement, we can get the strain. And we can also measure all sorts of cool things like cracks and, and whatnot. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, idea. In this particular case, we were using a freely available open source software which had been developed in Taiwan. It's called Impro Stereo. It doesn't require you, some of the advantages of it over a conventional commercial system is that you don't have to use uh, special cameras. So we literally used like cell phone cameras during one of our tests, which is really cool. Uh, it's all, it's all, we, all, we do all of the sort of 
post-processing in MATLAB. Uh, so here you can see the user interface of the software. This is sort of one, after camera calibration is over, we can see where our cameras are located in 3D space. And we're able to get some really interesting results. So this is the uh, surface strain during one of the hybrid tests. So you can clearly see the cracks in the concrete right, throughout the, as the test progresses. So one of the benefits is that once we started a hybrid test, we weren't actually able to stop it to mark cracks. So this was a really useful tool to do that. Yeah. This is strain. This is strain. Yeah. Exactly. You got it. You got it. Um, I'm showing you strain here, but we're able to get all sorts of cool uh, results. We could get X displacement, Y displacement, Z displacement, strain in any direction, different types of strain, engineering strain, true strain. We're able to get all sorts of parameters, including crack width. Exactly. Exactly. We did do that. Yep. And you put the images next to each other, and they're like perfect. It's like you can't, even small, really, really narrow cracks that we could hardly see when we're marking it with a marker, we can see it in the image correlation results. So we're, we're pretty excited about this technology. So we, we use it here in the lab. This is, I think I have another example. This was during the C shaped wall test, the bigger wall. Oh, sorry. That didn't work. Let's see here. Uh, Okay, maybe I'll just, okay. yeah, so this is during one of those tests. In this particular case, we used a commercially available digital image correlation software that, that we had in the lab there. And you can see we get uh, similar sort of results. Again, this was surface strain, but you can get all sorts of parameters with respect to structural response. Um, so yeah, we found that to be a pretty useful tool. So after that was over, we started to think about other ways that we could use digital image correlation, not only as a measurement tool. So one idea that I had was that, could we use crack distributions to measure damage? So the idea is that um, if you've ever heard of a fractal dimension, it essentially represents how complex a pattern is. And it turns out that cracks, concrete cracks, are fractal in nature. And that means that as the crack pattern becomes more complex, that means that we have more damage, the fractal dimension will increase. So what we were able to do is that using a bunch of test data, we were able to relate the fractal dimension to a level of damage. And then the idea was this, was that we have images of a damaged structure. So we're taking images of a structure as it becomes damaged or before and after it's damaged. We process those images using digital image correlation automatically. And then we compute this damage index based on fractal dimension so that we can come to under some understanding about how damaged our structure is and maybe is our structure safe to occupy. So this becomes sort of a artificially intelligent digital image correlation software that's able to automatically monitor, analyze, and assess the condition of your structure. That's obviously a very, very high level goal. We're just like testing this as an idea, but I think that there, it's an interesting idea and it's something that we could actually potentially use in the field. So we tried it during one of the tests. So we took the images from one of our hybrid tests. Here you can see the displacement response, some of the crack distributions at some of the points. And here is our sort of damage, automatic damage index calculator during the test. So you can see that as the crack pattern becomes more complex, the damage is essentially increasing. So we have some sort of promising results from a semi real world application. So we're Still thinking about how we can make this better, but it's an idea right now. The last thing that, the last application of this software that I'll mention is this idea. I mentioned before about this phenomenon, CFRP concrete debonding. It's when the CFRP sort of separates from the concrete underneath. So I was looking at this video uh, one night, and you can see, if you look here, you can see the debonding happening, right? Sort of, you see that? It be because of the speckle pattern, it becomes like an optical illusion, but it is getting closer to you. So I had this idea. Traditionally, what we would do in these types of tests is that we would use a hammer. We would sort of bang on the wall, and you, you can tell when it's debonded because it makes a very hollow sound. So then I thought, can we use digital image correlation to measure debonding instead of marking it with a hammer? So we started off, we had to make some modifications to our Impro Stereo software that we used to do di digital image correlation so that we could measure out of plane displacement because that's not what it was originally intended to do. So we added some modules. We essentially added a module so that you could map the out of plane displacement of a number of points over a surface of your structure. 
And then we sort of applied it in some very simple cases. So here you can see some of the results from a sort of test run. So we found that, OK, its software seems to work pretty well in terms of capturing out of plane displacement. This is like a very simple test. This is essentially a sheet of plastic, and it's me moving my hand around underneath it just to see if I can monitor where my hand is moving, because I had no idea whether this was going to work or not at that time. And then we used it in our tests. So we used sort of a, I used sort of a coarse grid of points, and then we used a finer grid to sort of see if we can track where this debonding is happening. And uh, the results are pretty, they're pretty good. So here we can see, for example, if we measure the response at a point there, we can see the debonding happening. Essentially, as the load goes back and forth, the sheet sort of buckles outward. And then when the load goes back, it goes back into tension. So it moves in and out of plane. And you can see that movement happening here. In contrast to another point where we didn't have any debonding, the, we don't see that same out of plane displacement. So again, this is sort of ideas that we have about how we can use digital image correlation to monitor the condition of our structures. Um, so I think that people are excited about this, especially in industry, because one of the problems that they have in industry with using this material is that they're never quite sure if, how good the bond is. And because the, its performance is so dependent on bond, they have a lot of questions about how, how can we tell if the sheet is fully bonded everywhere. So this is sort of an idea that we had. So that's my work on advanced sensors to date, mainly distributed fiber optic sensors and structural condition assessment. Finally, I'll sort of wrap things up with some collaborative research ideas that I have. This starts with obviously hybrid simulation as a test method. There's a goal moving forward to apply hybrid simulation, as I mentioned, to other structural hazards. In addition to sort of improving the test method, the test method is still in its infancy. We need uh, some help from other experts. So the idea about hybrid simulation is that it combines sort of disciplines from many, many, it combines expertise from many different fields. So we have, we need expertise from data analytics, from from, from people who know a lot about complex actuation, hydraulic control. We also collect a tremendous amount of data during these tests. Um, there's also this really interesting idea about distributed hybrid simulation. So how this would work is that imagine, that, imagine if you have a bridge and um, you could actually model the deck of the bridge in a software and test the peers in different labs they could be around Canada or around the world and connect the labs together using the internet so that they all communicate with the same numerical model. So this is what they call distributed fiber, or sorry, distributed hybrid simulation. So this is sort of an interesting uh, concept as well because there are a number of researchers in Canada who are all working on hybrid simulation. But again, if we're gonna do something like that, we need experts in communication and all these things that as a civil engineer, I'm, not, I'm definitely not an expert in. Um, finally, with respect to climate change, if we are able to get this hybrid simulation to work for other hazards, we can try to understand how structures behave during different extreme events. Obviously, climate change is fueling more frequent extreme events. So there's a serious question in civil engineering right now about what type of impact is that going to have on our infrastructure, especially in the long term. The second sort of area that I thought would be very interesting is the use of advanced sensors and robots in structural health monitoring. Again, this is very similar to what I know Neil has proposed uh, in the past. So this involves using sensors to monitor structures over their service life. So whether it's a distributed fiber optic sensor or digital image correlation, can we use these as tools to see how our structures are behaving over time? And it could be a long span structure like the new bridge here in Kingston, or it could be a pipeline, or there are all sorts of opportunities for these sensors. And the idea is that we could replace traditional inspection techniques that we use in civil engineering. It's basically a guy going out there with a clipboard and marking yes or no on a bunch of questions. We could maybe use a robot to do that instead. Not only would um, it be cheaper probably, but we, we also would get a lot more information likely. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity in that field. And then I think that there are many, many applications of robots in civil engineering that, we, that are still sort of, I think about at night now. So I'm thinking about how can we use robots to solve civil engineering problems? Because I think that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, especially in the construction industry, um, an industry that's, that's really, really big. So uh, I think there's also an opportunity for the use of advanced sensors and robots in post-disaster condition assessment. So coming from a background in earthquake engineering, we have a lot of questions about how, how can we do post-earthquake reconnaissance? How can we do it better? So traditionally what we've done is, again, it's a guy with a clipboard who goes into a damaged building and we try and assess, is the structure safe to occupy or not? So how can we use potentially robots 
and uh, artificial intelligence and advanced sensors to get a better understanding about the condition of our building after a disaster has happened. It doesn't have to be an earthquake. It could be any type of disaster. And then finally, I think that there are also applications for deep learning and structural engineering. I pulled this one example. This was a competition that they had last year in the United States. It was uh, put on by the Pacific, engineering Earth Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center. It w they called it the Image-Based Structural Damage Identification Competition. Essentially, they had a database of 20,000 labeled images. Those images included the type of component and the type of damage and uh, how damaged it was. And then tried to see if teams could train an algorithm to basically identify those parameters in images. So again, we're talking about post-disaster condition assessment of structures. Instead of having an inspector judge the condition of something, could we have an algorithm automatically figure out what type of component it is, how damaged is it, and is the structure safe to occupy? Those are the, sort of the ideas that we have moving forward. So that's the sort of the conclusion of my presentation today. I obviously have a lot of people to acknowledge. That was uh, you know, sort of a, a chunk of work there. So uh, contributions from CFI and NSERC in the test facilities that I worked in, as well as sort of experts from the National Center for Research on Earthquake Engineering in Taiwan, and grad students in tech support in all the labs. So thanks very much for my presentation. I hope that uh, you learned something about hybrid simulation and advanced sensors in civil engineering.